I'm starting now. Sanırım yavaş yavaş başlayabiliriz. Ee, öncelikle herkese merhabalar. Ben çok kısa bir Türkçe giriş yapayım. Sonrasında e, İngilizce olarak devam ediyor oluruz. E, bugün e, webinar serimize ya da webinar demeyeyim, meet up, online meetup serimize e, Chris Webb ile devam edeceğiz. Kendisi Microsoft'ta e, ürün grubunda, Power BI'nin ürün grubunda e, program manager olarak yer alıyor. Ve e, konumuzda e, Power BI'deki data setlerin refreshini ilgilendiren aslında bir sürü konu olacak. Farklı farklı konu başlıklarına birlikte değineceğiz. Umarım herkes için verimli bir etkinlik olur. Sözü Halil'e bırakacağım. Öncesinde belki İngilizce'de Chris'e teşekkür edebilirim. Chris, thank you for your participation and your contribution to our community, first of all. I am sure that it will be great content for us and for community. Maybe Halil... Uh, you can continue, then we can hand over to Chris. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Chris, welcome. It is our great, pl great pleasure to uh, have you with us. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, today, uh, for those who may not know Chris, uh, Chris is uh, a member of uh, Power BI CAT team and he is a long time MVP and he is one of the most knowledgeable person in Power BI world, especially if the topic is Power Query and M um, and CSV files as a data source. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, today we are talking about, we will be talking about the Power Query data set refreshes and best practice regarding with that. Uh, uh, thanks again, Chris, for joining us. I'm handing over to you. Thank you. All right. Let me share my desktop. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we do. Excellent. Thank you. OK, so welcome, everybody. This is my presentation on uh, performance tuning dataset refresh in Power BI. So before we start, let me explain what I'm going to talk about. This is a brand new presentation. It's one that I've not given before. It's one that I only finished writing um, about 10 minutes ago. 
But the reason I wanted to do a presentation on this was um, there are lots and lots of videos and blog posts talking about performance tuning your Power BI reports, but not very many um, resources available for people who want to be able to make refresh run faster. And refresh is a very important thing. I think the problem with refresh is that actually there are lots and lots of different parts of Power BI that are involved in refresh, so it can be quite complicated to understand everything. But what I'm going to talk about today is absolutely everything in Power BI that is related to refresh. So we will talk about how to measure refresh performance. We will look at lots of different tools that uh, allow you to do that. We will talk briefly about data modeling, about tuning your data source. We will talk a bit about Power Query. We will talk about the analysis services engine. We will talk about the differences between Power BI desktop and the Power BI service. Um, we only have an hour, maybe less than an hour, so we won't be able to go into absolutely every topic in a lot of detail, but hopefully this will be enough to give you an understanding of all of the different areas that need tuning and also all of the things that you can do or the things you need to think about. So let's start off by saying, you know, why should we care about data set refresh performance? You know, what does it matter if it takes, you know, a couple of hours for, for my data set to refresh? Well, I think if you've ever developed a large data set with Power BI, and if you've deliver, developed reports that need to be ready for business users by a certain time of day, you will probably know that refresh can be really important because if your users come to work, uh, they used to come to the office, maybe they turn on their laptop at home in the morning and they want to see reports and those reports are still showing yesterday's data, they're not going to be happy. They don't want to wait until 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock to see their reports. And how quickly those reports are ready depends on how quickly you can refresh the data. Also, your users might want to refresh multiple times during the day. And, you know, again, performance is going to be important there. If you're a developer, you will probably understand that refresh is important because, you know, we've all sat around waiting for a long time uh, for data to load in Power BI and anything we can do to make that go faster is going to make us as developers more productive. And, you know, of course, during the day, maybe if something goes wrong and you have to refresh, you need to you know, fix that and get your data back, get your reports back online quickly. And again, the faster refresh happens, the faster you can do that. And then finally, of course, if your refresh is slow and taking up lots of resources, that can make refresh of other data sets in the Power BI service slow, and it can make people's reports slow as well in some cases. So we want to make refresh fast. Now, the next question is, how fast should it be? You know, what, what do we need to aim for? Now, if you're a new BI developer, there is an easy mistake to make. So you think, OK, well, how fast should refresh be? When do my users want data? And what do you do? You go to talk to your business users. So here is a typical business user. You might recognize her as the Power BI lady from PowerBI.com. And you ask a stupid question. You say, how often do you want your data to refresh? What does the business user say? The business user always says, I want real time data. It always happens. So don't ask that question because they will always say that. They don't know. It's not their job to know what the issues are. So what you need to do instead is ask them what they need, what they want, not what they want. You have to understand when they want their reports ready during the day. Is it 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. or 7 a.m.? You need to understand when the source data for your reports is ready. And that gives you the time window when you can do your refresh. So if your data is ready at 
6 a.m. and your reports are re need to be ready by 9 a.m., then you have three hours to do your refresh. You also need to understand how often your source data changes. You need to understand how many times you need to refresh in a day. And you also need to understand what the business need for this is, because again, users will say, oh, I want my reports to refresh eight times a day. There is no point to do this if your data only changes once a day. So these are the questions you need to ask to understand what the business need is, to understand how much time you've got available for doing refresh. And when you've done that, you will know how much or how fast your data set refresh needs to be. Then you can start the tuning process. Now performance tuning, well, any performance tuning always needs to start right from the very beginning of building your Power BI report. It is a really bad idea to build your Power BI report, put it into production, then realize that it's slow and then think, oh, wow, uh, yeah, I've got a problem. I need to go and fix it. You need to think about performance right from the very beginning. And the first question you probably have to answer when you're building a Power BI report is one that is very important for refresh performance. It's choosing a storage mode. Now, you probably know that in Power BI, there are a couple of different storage modes, different ways that Power BI can work with data. First of all, you have the default, which is import mode. In import mode, you're taking the data from the data source and copying it in to Power BI into a data set. So this is the default. And it's the default for a reason because it gives you the fastest report performance. The problem with import mode is because you're copying data into Power BI. If the data in your data source changes, you have to refresh. Now, there are some other options. There are push data sets where you can push data into a data set through an API. Um, it's not very popular. There are many limitations. I'm not going to talk about push mode. Um, the other major storage mode that you have to think about is direct query mode. So in direct query mode, you are able to store no data inside Power BI. And when your report runs, it runs queries against the data source to get the data on demand. Now, direct query is only available for certain data sources like relational databases like SQL Server. And it does mean that you don't need to refresh at all. But the big problem with direct query mode is that query performance, report performance is slower. It can be a lot slower. And this is why I always recommend that you use import mode unless you have a good reason not to use it. So import mode is the default way of storing data in Power BI for a good reason. And you should always think about using import mode. Now, the interesting thing is, though, now in Power BI, you have the choice between having some tables in import mode and some tables in direct query mode in your um, data set. Now, that means that you can choose between data, between storage modes, and this can be used to improve your overall refresh performance. Because in direct query mode, remember, there is no need to refresh data. So this feature is called composite models. And with composite models, you could have some tables in import mode, which need to be refreshed, and some tables in direct query mode, which don't need to be refreshed. So it could be that if you have a large table that takes a long time to refresh, you could use direct query mode for that, not import mode. And that will take your overall refresh performance down. It will make it much faster. It could also be that you can build aggregations on top of a direct query table. Aggregations are pre-aggregated tables that can be used to improve query performance. They can be stored in import mode as well. And that could mean that even though your large table is in direct query mode, if your reports need to run on aggregated data, you can have a much smaller aggregation table in your data set and that will improve performance as well. 
So you can mix and match direct query and import mode if you need to. Now the rest of this presentation is going to be all about performance tuning for import mode because that is the only place where um, you actually need to refresh data. So the first important thing to uh, do before you start to tune um, refresh and import mode is to understand what happens when you refresh an import mode data set. And you need to understand what all the different components involved are. So what we see here on this diagram is I've got data sources here on the left hand side and then in this blue box this is Power BI and inside Power BI there are two important components, two parts. We have data sets and data sets are powered by the analysis services engine. So analysis services is a very old product. Uh, it, it's existed for 20 years. It exists as a standalone on-premises server. It exists as a cloud service, Azure Analysis Services. But the Analysis Services engine is also inside Power BI, and that's where your data set is stored. So you have the Analysis Services engine inside Power BI, and then you also have the Power Query engine inside Power BI as well. This is what you see in the Power Query editor, and this is the component that does all of your extract, transform, and load. So when you refresh a data set inside Power BI, what happens is that starts off in the analysis services engine. The analysis services engine then runs queries to get the data it needs for all of the tables in the data set. Each of these queries is linked to a Power Query query, and each Power Query query might be linked to other Power Query queries as well. And the Power Query queries in turn go back to the data sources to get data. The data is returned to the Power Query engine where it does transformations and so on. And then from the Power Query engine, the data goes back to the Analysis Services engine where it's loaded into the data structures used by the data set. So we can see there are three places where refresh might be slow. It might be slow in because of something happening in the data source. It might be slow in the Power Query engine, and it might be slow in the Analysis Services engine. If we're going to tune this, like I said, we need to tune across all of these three, three things. And the process that I would follow is this. First of all, after you've chosen your storage mode, you need to think about modeling your data properly. Then you need to remove all of the data that you don't need. Then you go on to tuning your data source. Then you tune your Power Query queries. And then finally, you need to tune the analysis services engine. And of course, you know, it might be that you tune in one place and you have to go back to another to do things. But these are all of the things that you need to take into account. And it's also important when you're tuning to understand that tuning performance of refresh on your desktop in Power BI desktop might be different to the performance you get in the Power BI service. So you have to test both. Now the next question you have to think about is how do you measure performance for refresh? How can you see what happens um, when you refresh and how can you know how long refresh takes? Because if you don't know how long refresh takes, you can't know whether any changes you make are making refresh faster or slower. And this is where we will see the first tool that's important for tuning dataset refresh. So the tool, tool that I always use for the most important tool that I use for um, tuning refresh performance is actually SQL Server Profiler. So SQL Server Profiler is a tool that is meant for use with SQL Server. It was also, it also supports connecting to analysis services. 
And because the analysis services engine lives inside Power BI, you can actually connect SQL Server Profiler up to Power BI Desktop and see what happens when refresh takes place. Now, it isn't obvious or easy to see how to do this, but I will show you. So what I've got here is a Power BI file with all of my um, demo set up in. And let's say that this is the data set that I want to test refresh on. The first thing I need is another tool. I need to have a tool called DAX Studio installed. So DAX Studio is a free community developed tool. Uh, it's really useful. It's really great. I strongly recommend that you download and install it if you don't already have it. And you need to open up DAX Studio. So DAX Studio can connect to a number of different places and it can connect to an open Power BI file. So I'm going to connect to the Power BI file that I've got open. And here I would be able to run DAX queries. But there is only one important thing that I want to use DAX Studio for here. DAX Studio makes it very easy to connect SQL Server Profiler up to the analysis services engine instance that's inside Power BI. So I can go to the advanced tab on the DAX Studio ribbon, click SQL Server Profiler, and it opens up Profiler for me. And here, Profiler thinks that it's connected up to analysis services. I've got the latest version of Profiler installed. Um, there are new releases almost every month, so I really recommend that you install uh, the latest release of Profiler. The next thing you need to do is choose some events. Now, Profiler can give you a lot of detailed information about what happens when refresh takes place in Power BI, but the only two events that I'm going to choose at this point are the command begin and command end events. So when I do a refresh in Power BI Desktop, this is going to execute a refresh command inside the analysis services engine, and this will allow me to see when those refresh commands begin and end. So I will run this. And then I can go back to Power BI Desktop. I can choose a table, doesn't matter which one. I can choose, click on the refresh button to refresh multiple things, but also the easiest thing to do here is just to right click on a table here in the fields pane, refresh data, and that will just refresh this table. So when I click refresh here, this will start off a refresh. It will load the data in. We can see that happening. I go back to Profiler and I can see a number of commands executed. Now, a lot of these will be irrelevant. Uh, it's quite easy to find the one that is the process. So here I'm going to grab event subclass. I need to move the text data column over and then I want to find the duration column. The duration column is the column that tells me how long in milliseconds a command took and the command that took the longest time here, which is almost six seconds, is the refresh command. You can see that here. If I go down and have a look in the text, there's quite a lot going on here, but the thing to look out for is this refresh command inside all this big chunk of XML. So that tells us the ex that the refresh is taking place. Like I said, it's pretty easy to spot because it's going to be the only thing that takes any time. And this figure of 5870, that's 5,870 milliseconds, six seconds almost, that tells you how long the refresh took overall. So that's something that I'm going to be doing a lot for the rest of this presentation. There is more detail we can get, but that's the important thing. It's also important, like I said, to understand what's happening with refresh in the service. Um, refresh may behave differently after you've published your data set up to the Power BI service. So it's important to see how long refresh takes um, once you've done that. Go to my browser. Here is a workspace with the data set in. 
I've got it. I've refreshed it a number of times. I can see how long each refresh took by going to click on the ellipses here, settings, and going to refresh history. And I can see here the start and end times of my refreshes, and it's quite easy to calculate then how long the refresh took for each one of these scheduled refreshes. If you've got Power BI Premium and you go to the admin portal, you can see that there is a, a new refresh summary page here for all of the data sets in a premium capacity. So here on the history tab, you can see a list of the refreshes and their durations and the average duration over time and the outcome and so on. There's also quite a nice scheduled page here that shows how many refreshes are scheduled in any one time of day. Another thing that you've got if you've got premium, and this is really useful, is the Power BI Premium Capacity Metrics app. So this is an app you can download and install uh, for free, and this allows you to analyze um, quite detailed information about what's happening on your Power BI Premium Capacity. And one of the things that it allows you to see is how long refreshes took. You need to click on the refresh button up here uh, for individual workspaces and data sets. And you can see the average duration of this, the maximum duration, uh, and you've got lots of other different analytics here. This tends to be more useful for seeing what happened, kind of long term trends for your data set so that you can see whether it's getting slower or faster over time. Moving on, the next thing you need to think about for refresh performance is data modeling. Now, I won't speak a lot about data modeling because data modeling is one of those things that um, is important for, you know, for not only refresh performance, but also query performance for making your calculations work properly. Lots and lots of things. You know, you will never be successful with Power BI unless you have modeled your data correctly. And the good news is that if you've modeled your data correctly for query performance, you are probably also going to get um, better performance for refresh as well. And the general rule with data modeling for Power BI is you should always, always build a star schema. I don't care how your data is formatted. I don't care you know, about any, whether you're lazy or not. You should always try to build a star schema. I deal with a lot of customers who have problems with Power BI and almost always the problems come back to not modeling data correctly. So you need to have a star schema. You need to have fact tables and dimensions. If you want to understand what a star schema is. We have. An article on the Power BI document uh, inside the Power BI documentation called Understanding Star, Star Schemas and the Importance for Power BI. Um, there are lots of books written about this, but this is a nice short um, introductory topic. Uh, so if you haven't read it, if you don't know what a star schema is, I strongly recommend you go away and read this uh, and think about modeling your data correctly. You know, quite often I see people who've got you know, very large wide tables with lots of columns um, instead of having separate fact tables and dimension tables. Um, people who have, you know, lots of measures which are uh, effectively one measure for each time period which needs to be unpivoted. Um, people who don't set their data types correctly, for example, people who use the double data type instead of the currency data type. All of these things can be important for query performance, but they also count for refresh performance as well. So absolutely always, always build a star schema. And I've got an example of this here to show you. So if I go back to Power BI desktop, uh, if I remember where it's gone, here we go. 
So if we have a look at my diagram view here, this is a star schema. I've loaded it from data stored in CSV, but it came originally from a uh, SQL Server database. I've got a fact table with sales information in, and then I've got a table called dim date, which is my date dimension table, and I've got a dimension table called dim customer. So three tables here, a fact table and two dimension tables. This is how data should be modeled. I've also got the same data combined together into a single large table called combined customer internet sales table. It has exactly the same columns in, but it's all just put together in one table. Now, this also comes from uh, a CSV file as well. If we go to profiler and we clear this, and I refresh just this big large table. Remember, this is all coming from CSV. There's nothing that can be optimized here. You can see it takes mm, quite a long time to load. There's only one table, but taking almost seven seconds to load here. If, however, I refresh just these three tables. Now, these are only the three tables that will refresh when I click the refresh button up here. I've set this up to do this. What we'll find, what we should find, is the data is much faster to load. Go back to here, and the refresh in the analysis services engine only took three seconds. So, almost twice as fast just from using a star schema. The next thing to think about, and this is also important when you're modeling data, is that you should only ever load the data you need. And there are two parts to this. The most important thing you need to do is to remove any columns that you don't need. So because of the way that Power, the analysis services engine stores data, it's a column store database, the number of rows in a table is not always as important as the number of columns. And so you will get a smaller model and faster refresh from removing columns that aren't necessary. It's very easy to connect to a data source and not think about this and just bring in all of the columns you want, but this can be very dangerous. So remove any columns that you don't need before you load the data in. You can do this easily inside the Power Query Editor. And also filter out any rows you don't need as well. Do you need to load all of the data or can you maybe limit it in some way? Can you limit it down to one or two years? You know, doing this will also reduce the amount of data that loads into the analysis services engine, and this will also make things faster as well. Now, it's quite easy to remove data, but like I said, a lot of people just connect to a data source and bring everything in because you might not know what data you need and what data you don't need. The problem with doing this, the problem with loading all of the data you've got is that after you've gone into production, it can be very difficult to remove data because you don't know whether people are using it. You know, if you bring in a column, how do you know if somebody's using it in a report? It's not actually easy to do. So what I say is delete the data first if you think you don't need it. It's quite easy to add a column back if you do decide you need it. And if you've got no, if you don't have the data loaded, the worst thing that can happen is a user complains and says, I need to see this particular column. You can add it back. It's much easier to add a column than to remove it later. Another related topic that I'm not going to demo here, but I, I will show you that I've got a blog post about it, is that it's possible if you're using premium to only load the data you need in Power BI desktop using the new deployment pipelines feature. Now, I don't know whether anybody has premium here. That's why I was not going to um, show the demo, but um, I have a blog post that you can find here uh, showing how you can use deployment pipelines to work with a small amount of data in Power BI desktop and in your development environment. And then when you push that through to test or production, you can go in and um, 
change your data source, change how the filtering happens and, and load more data. The next thing you need to think about is the type of data source that you're using. This can have a big impact on refresh performance. So how quickly can your data source send data to Power BI? There are going to be some big differences. Um, generally speaking, the fastest data source for Power BI is going to be some type of relational database. Probably SQL Server will be the best or any Microsoft relational database. So that will give you much faster performance than loading from a, form, a text file. Um, if you are working with text files, you will find that CSV files are much faster than any other type of text file. Um, Excel files, which are very popular for loading data into Power BI, are probably the slowest data source you can use. So if you have a choice between using CSV and Excel, I strongly recommend that you use CSV files. Another thing that people often run into is they find that data stored in SharePoint is quite slow because with SharePoint you have to go through an API to get data and download it. Um, so, you know, sometimes there are there are lots of benefits to using SharePoint as a data source, um, but I would recommend that if you can avoid, if you can work with um, a fast data source like SQL Server, this will make refresh much, much faster. Um, if you're working with data in another data source, it might be even worth thinking about staging it in a fast data source before you start to load it into Power BI. So if you have a large number of Excel files or CSV files, if you can load that data into SQL Server before it gets to Power BI, that can have some advantages as well. If we go back to Power BI Desktop, I can prove how much faster SQL Server is than um, a CSV file because I've got this fact internet sales table here stored in CSV. If I go to profiler and let's just refresh fact internet sales, the CSV version here and refresh this, I can see how long this takes in profiler. So we're loading the data. And this took 2.6 seconds. I go back to here and I load the same data coming from SQL Server. You can see that's an awful lot quicker already. That was only 1.3 seconds. And if I refresh the same data stored in an Excel workbook, You can already see that it is much, much, much slower here. And that was five and a half seconds. The other advantage, of course, with using a relational database like SQL Server to store your data is that you can tune the SQL queries that are run. Um, for example, you could use SQL Server Profiler to see what's going on and um, load the data there. Sorry about that. Somebody calling my phone. I'll ignore that. There are other tools if you're working with other different types of data source. Um, for example, if you're working with um, a web service, you can use a tool called Fiddler. Um, if you're working with um, text files, there's a tool called Process Monitor, which allows you to see data loading from a data source. And of course, we've got query diagnostics in the Power Query Editor that I'll show you in a moment. The final thing to think about data sources is where the data source is located, because if your data source is located a long way away from Power BI, then that can affect performance as well. So try to locate Power BI or your data source close to Power BI. If you're using an on-premises data gateway, then think about locating your on-premises data gateway close to the data source as well. After you've tuned your data source, you then have to tune the Power Query engine. 
It's important to understand that the Power Query engine or the performance of the Power Query engine can vary a lot depending on where the queries are running. Now, generally speaking, when you're developing, um, the Power Query engine does a lot more work in Power BI desktop than if you're refreshing in the Power BI service. And this is because it does a lot of things to try and make your life easier as a developer, but this can make things a lot slower. So this means that what you see in Power BI desktop could be a lot slower than the refresh you get in the Power BI service, simply because of this extra stuff that the Power Query engine does. And I'll show you that in a moment. Another important thing to point out is that if you're using an on-premises data source and you're going through the on-premises data, uh, going through an on-premises data gateway, then the Power Query engine executes on the same PC that your on-premises data gateway is installed on, not in the cloud, but on the machine where the on-premises data gateway is located. And performance of your Power Query queries will depend on a couple of different factors. It'll depend on the hardware of the machine you're running on, um, various configuration settings and you know, the efficiency of the queries themselves. Now, the next question we have to answer is how can we measure the performance of our Power Query queries? This is where Profiler comes in again. If I stop this and we open up uh, and we open up another profiler trace from DAX Studio. And we go into a little bit more detail. I'm going to include not just command end and command begin and end, but I'm also going to use two more events, progress report, begin and end. And click run. Now this gives us a lot more information about what goes on inside the Power Query engine. Uh, when our, oh, so not only the analysis services engine, uh, but also the Power Query engine about what ha about um, what happens when a refresh runs. So I'm just going to drag these columns over here again. And if I go back to Power BI Desktop, and you know, let's refresh a query again. We can not only see how long the overall refresh took, but SQL Server Profiler also makes it uh, possible to see how long each Power Query query took. Now, rather than looking at the overall refresh command, inside the refresh commands, you can see that now we've got a large number of progress report begin and end events. And if I drag event subclass down into here, there are two events that tell us how long a particular Power Query query took to run. First of all, you have to look for the progress report end event execute SQL, because as far as the analysis services engine is concerned, it's executing a query to get data from a Power Query query, and it actually just executes what, what looks like a very simple SQL, SQL query here. Now, this gives us one duration, now this is the amount of time it took for the query to start to return data. Now that may be the full execution time, that may not be. There's another event here called read data, which also gives you a time. And this is the amount of time it took for the engine to read the data from the query. So this is when the query started to return data. This is when the query kind of, this is how long uh, the analysis services engine took to read data from the data source. And these are the two values that you need to look at when you need to understand the performance of an individual Power Query query. It is also possible to use Power Query diagnostics to look and see what happens when a Power Query query runs. If we go to transform data and we go to the tools tab up here, we can start diagnostics or we can uh, click diagnose step. If I start diagnostics, I can then go to the main Power BI screen, and do a refresh. Um, I'm not going to do that now, but just to save time, I've got some diagnostics already given here. Um, when you 
run diagnostics and then stop afterwards, you'll get some extra queries which connect to local log files. And here we've got some detailed information about what happened inside the Power Query engine when a query executed. Um, these are not very helpful. Um, they are quite detailed. Um, so again, on my blog, I've got some uh, blog posts with some extra Power Query queries um, that allow you, that help you to understand um, how uh, or make sense of this data. And I've got a query here that connects to this detailed query and transforms the data and makes it a lot more easy to understand. Uh, and effectively what we've got here is a query that tells you the overall amount of time taken in the Power Query engine in a single row. So exclusive duration here is uh, for this particular query was 0 0.1 seconds. And what I all I've done is made it easy to um, aggregate all that up into a single query so that I can I can see what's going on. I've also got another query here that um, transforms the data and makes it easy to display in a decomposition tree. And I've got an example of that. So if I go up to here and we have a look at the decomp tree using this query, I can connect to the detailed um, trace returned by query diagnostics and I can see that my exclusive duration was 0 0.17 seconds. I can drill down and look at all of the events in here about what's going on and then finally see the operation here that actually took the most time. But usually, like I said, I prefer to use Profiler because that gives me all I need to know. It gives me the overall amount of time uh, that the query took to run. There are also some configuration settings um, that you need to think about. Well, probably the first thing that you need to think about with um, Power Query is if you've got queries in the Power Query editor that you don't want to load into your data set, you need to disable those queries. So if I go to the Power Query editor here, for any query, I just need to right click and I can deselect this option and if I deselect this option, like I've got here, the enable load is not selected, that query is not loaded into the data set. Quite often new users will accidentally um, leave that on and load lots of data into their data sets they don't actually need. It's also possible to deselect include in report refresh. This simply means that in Power BI Desktop, um, when you click the refresh button, this table isn't loaded, but this setting is not doesn't um, have any effect in a Power BI after your data set has been published up to the Power BI service. There are a couple of other really important configuration settings. If you go to file. Options and settings options. And then go to current file data load. There are a few th really important things here. First of all, I always deselect auto date time. This creates some hidden tables in the background for every date and time value. If you've modeled your data correctly, then this will um, this just means that you don't get extra date tables built. Perhaps the most important setting, though, is this one. So this setting allow data preview to download in the background is on by default and what this does is every time you refresh in desktop it recreates all of the values that you see uh, all the snapshots of data that you see for every step in your query in the power query editor now this makes development faster but if you're working with slow data sources and complex queries it can really make refresh in power bi desktop slow so if I'm working with a large number of queries and complex queries, I always turn this off and I've seen situations where this makes refresh go from over an hour in desktop to a couple of seconds. Something else you might want to think about is this enable parallel loading of date tables. So by default, this means that um, you that when a when your data set is refreshed, all of the queries will be um, run in parallel to get data. Now, usually that makes things fast, but in some cases it can slow 
things down. It could overload your data source. Um, there's also some caching the Power Query engine does, and um, if you turn off parallelism, it actually makes better use of the cache. So these are all things to experiment with, but if you take one thing away from this presentation, this setting here is the important one to turn off if you're finding refreshes slow in Power BI Desktop. Another really important thing to think about with the Power Query engine is query folding. Query folding refers to the way that the Power Query engine can take the transformations that you do and push them back to the data source. Now, this is something that only happens for some data sources like relational databases like SQL Server, and it's only happen, it only happens for some transformations. But it is another really important thing that if you can make it work for you, will make your refresh much, much faster. So let's see an example of this. Oh, cancel this. So if I go to the Power Query editor here, I've got a query that connects to the dim date table in a SQL Server database. So I've connected to a table in my AdventureWorks DW database. I've got the data from the dim date table and I've done two things. I've removed some columns and I have filtered some rows. The important thing is with this query, the way that I've set it up, query folding takes place. And that means that when this query runs, the Power Query engine doesn't get the whole dim date table, it will take the transformations that I've asked to do, like removing the columns and filtering the rows, and turn those into the SQL query that it uses to get data. Now, for a SQL Server database, I can also see the query that is run against the relational database. And I can do this by right clicking and going to view native query. And here you can see the SQL that's generated by the Power Query engine to get data. Now, you can imagine how important this is for performance. It's important to understand that not everything you can do in the Power Query engine can be folded back to the data source. It's also important to understand that some data sources don't support this because you can't do this with a CSV file because there's no query language to generate against a CSV file. There are a few other things that you can do that will also stop query folding. So for example, here I've got a query that connects the same data and does the same thing, but when I right click, view native query is grayed out. Why? Well, that's because I've added an index column as an extra step. This is a good example of something that I can do in the Power Query Editor that stops query folding taking place. Another thing that I can do, again, a query that looks almost identical is if you write your own SQL to get data from a data source, this automatically stops any further query folding from taking place. So those are some things to avoid. Um, generally speaking, tuning other things in the Power Query engine is quite complicated. Um, we're not going to have time to go through uh, all of the details on this, uh, but you know, there are lots of blog posts out there talking about different techniques for improving Power Query queries um, that I won't go into. Um, other things to look out for, um, you might want to tune the on-premises data gateway. Uh, if you want to do that, you want to see what's happening in the on-premises data gateway, you'll need to turn on logging. And it's not only possible to turn on logging to get detailed information about what's going on. There's also a Power Query, a Power BI template that you can download and install to analyze log information. The final thing that I want to talk about with tuning the Power Query engine though is using data flows. Now, data flows are basically the same engine that lives in Power Query, but they allow you to connect to data sources and create the output of a query in a shared place that you know, other people can then connect to and get data from. Um, there are a couple of reasons why data flows might be faster than running queries in the Power Query engine. Um, for example, 
data privacy checks are turned off, which could could, could give you better performance. Uh, if you're running in premium, there are a few other um, settings that you can set that improve Power Query Engine. But the most important reason why um, data flow performance or data flows can give you query performance is because they allow you to connect to a data source, do a transformation once and share that result between multiple data, source, data sets. For example, let's imagine you have a table and a data source that two different data sets need to connect to. They need to connect to, they need to get the data and they need to do, a, do the same set of transformations. It would be possible for both data sets to create the same query and when they refresh, the same two queries are executed and that work is done twice. With a data flow, the advantage is you can create an entity and a data flow that does those transformations. It does those transformations once, it stores those the output inside Power BI, and that transformed output can be loaded very quickly and easily into the data sets. So you can see that rather than doing the same work twice, there are always going to be advantages to doing it once. The other advantage, I suppose, of a data flow as well is that you can have different data flows that execute at different times when different data is available. So if one part of your data, one data source you're using is available uh, much earlier than the others, you can use a data flow to do any transformations. So the transformed data from there is available much more quickly. And last of all, we come to tuning the analysis services engine. Um, there isn't actually that much that I can say about tuning the analysis services engine right now. Profiler will tell you a lot about what's going on inside the analysis services engine when refresh takes place, but there aren't too many things that you can do or change. Um, this will change a little bit in the future. Uh, in the next, uh, in the in the future, in a future release of Power BI Desktop, uh, we have integration for other third-party tools, one of which is Tabular Editor. Uh, Tabular Editor is another community tool, uh, and this will allow you to change some extra properties in Power BI, which can also um, improve performance. For example, is available in MDX and encoding hints, but these are very, very advanced properties that I wouldn't recommend you um, change unless you really know what you're doing. Probably the one most important thing that I can tell you uh, about tuning the analysis services engine is about calculated columns and calculated tables. New Power BI users uh, quite often make a lot of use of calculated columns and calculated tables. Um, and they're quite easy to work with, uh, but they do come with a price. And the price is that calculated columns and calculated tables are evaluated during refresh. An extra column on a table, well, a calculated column, that is something that needs to be calculated at refresh time. Calculated columns are also calculated and persisted at refresh time. And so the more you use calculated columns and calculated tables, the slower your refresh will tend to be. Now, generally speaking, um, if you can avoid a calculated column and use a measure instead, that can make a big difference to overall refresh time. So I would recommend that you try to avoid using calculated columns or pre-calculating any values that you can use measures to calculate instead. Uh, and calculated tables, well, again, I don't make too much use of calculated tables always. If you've got a calculated table, uh, you need to think, can I do get the same result just by using measures or can I pre-calculate the data that I need in a table in my data source? Um, but calculated columns and calculated tables are not always bad. You know, there is going to be lots of situations where doing using a calculated column is the fastest option and it's the only way to get you know, fast performance inside your reports. So I'm not saying never use calculated columns and calculated tables, but always think very carefully because they are calculated at refresh time and they may, may make your refresh slower. And then the other thing to mention with analysis services is we have the incremental refresh option. Um, incremental refresh allows you to, rather than loading an entire table, uh, just load the data that's changed. And this is now available with Power BI Pro with shared capacity as well as premium. Um, 
there is extensive documentation showing how to set this up. But of course, the obvious advantage for using um, incremental refresh is that you're not getting all of the data from your data source. You're only getting the data that's changed, and this can make a massive difference to performance. Uh, by default, it works best with relational databases like SQL Server, but you can actually make it work. And I've got a blog post on this topic for web services. Uh, a guy called Miguel Escobar showed how to use it with a data with, um, for example, folders containing multiple files. But incremental refresh can be really important for making uh, overall refresh much faster, simply again because it reduces the amount of data you're loading. And then the very last thing to say is it's always important to monitor refresh in the Power BI service. Um, as I said, you can see refresh times in the Power BI service by looking at your dataset refresh history. But there's also one last thing to point out, which is not always obvious. When you schedule refresh, refresh doesn't always take place exactly at the time when you scheduled it for. Scheduled refresh is takes place well when you schedule refresh and the time comes for your refresh to happen the power bi service will not refresh always immediately it will refresh only when it feels like it has the resources available so in power bi shared capacity that could be several minutes before it's ready to do the refresh now generally speaking in premium that's less likely to happen unless your capacity is overloaded and there are too many data sets. Uh, and of course, with Power BI Premium as well, with more resources, especially when you have a Power BI Premium P2 capacity, you'll get more parallelism and you'll get faster performance as well. That brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've learned something. Um, like I said, it was the first time I've done the presentation, so I need to work a little bit on the timings, but you know, we covered almost everything. Um, I know it's the full hour now, but I'm happy to stick around and answer questions if anybody's got questions. Well, we do have some questions for you. One of them is very related with the subject. Is index important for SQL Server for better refresh? Um, yes. So. Sorry about this. I should have put my phone outside in the other room. Um, oh. <laughs> and of course, nobody's picking up the phone. All right. So the uh, the question about indexes is, well, um, if your index makes the SQL query faster, then yes, it's going to be important for refresh. But that's more of a question for um, SQL Server performance than it is for Power BI. Anything you do to make the SQL queries that um, Power BI generates run faster uh, is going to make refresh faster. OK. And uh, there is another question. Does performance refresh matter if it is the same time for the report to load when they view from the service? I'm not sure I understand the question. The question there. about. Yeah, yeah. I think it is about looking at the performance or reports on the server while at the same time refreshing the data. I'm not sure. OK, about as well. so yes, that can affect performance. If you're viewing a report while a refresh takes place, then that can make the viewing the report slower because you know, refresh takes up a lot of resources. It takes up um, memory and CPU, and that could affect the performance of viewing the report. Yes. OK. Um, another question. Uh, is there a pure star schema versus anything almost star schema? I different relations exists between the dimensions. Um, that's again a very difficult question to mm -hmm. answer. Um, yeah. I mean, I think something that's almost like a star schema is going to be better than something that's not like a star schema. Um, the closer you can make your um, data set look like a star schema, the better. OK, uh, but it depends. You know, always test these things. There is no such thing as a a kind of rule that you should always, always follow. You should always test. Mm 
Okay. Uh, another questions regarding calendar tables. Hmm? Is it best to use calculated table or uh, to create another data to to the calendar, which is the so best way? Creating a create table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, what I do with a, cal a calendar table is you should probably have a calendar table created in a data source that everybody can access uh, and using data flows to expose a calendar table is going to be good. Now for performance, calculated tables are fine for a calendar table. Um, the point about a calendar table is that it's something that almost every data set you build will have to have. And if you're using a calculated table, you're going to have to recreate the calculated table every time and you're going to have to copy and paste the code and that can cause um, maintenance issues. If you create a calendar table in your data source and expose it through a data flow, then everybody can share the same calendar table. They don't have to recreate it themselves. They won't make mistakes and you can fix bugs in the calendar table or add extra columns and do it once and then everybody gets the same. Uh, gets the results. So using data flows is strongly suggested for almost yeah. every data source. Or any, well, I yeah, would say using data flows for every data source, but for calendar tables, this is something that everybody should be sharing the same calendar table. So putting it somewhere that everybody can access it like a data flow, that that's um, a good idea. Okay, one generic questions. Uh, what about cases for self-service BI where business wants all facts and dimensions in one big port? In one big table. Um, I would say the business doesn't in know what it's asking for. <laughs> Um, if, the, if the business says it wants that. all of its facts and dimensions in one big table, <laughs> the business is asking for something stupid. I totally agree with that command. <laughs> so some user education is necessary. Okay, I'm getting the questions. Uh, sorry. Related with the seminar uh, webinar topic, but sometimes Power BI shuts off when trading with big data. What could be the reason for this? Uh, uh, it could be that you're I, running I out of what memory on your big PC. Data means. Um, so, yeah, you know, and the analysis services engine is an in-memory um, engine, and if you're working on a PC with a, you know with a limited amount of RAM and you're working with a large amount of data, it could be that um, you know, you're just running out of memory when you're loading data. Um, it is possible to, and there are lots of things that you can do to reduce the size of a data set in memory. Um, for example, removing columns, filtering rows, um, splitting up columns so that you've got a smaller number of um, distinct values. Um, there are lots of different techniques you can use, but running out of memory is probably the reason why Power BI Desktop is crashing. Okay. So the other uh, alternative another, is to buy more memory. Okay, another question. In terms of star schema, having two fact tables connected with conformed dimensions is fine. Yes, absolutely. So okay. it's perfectly OK to have multiple fact tables. Uh, shared data set is fine from report rendering, rendering perspective. Is data set fine from rendering perspective? Yes, shared data sets are a very good thing and I recommend that everybody use them. And they have no, they, they shouldn't have any effect on uh, report performance. OK, uh, we do have a few more questions for you. Uh, sorry. We, we, we get some, we get subtotals in with formulas and we cannot determine the reason. What is your suggestion? 
the tax question maybe or data modeling question yeah so um that sounds like so you're getting if you're getting incorrect subtotals then it sounds like you've got a problem with your dax okay uh, another question i think this is the last one one of the last ones uh, hi, Chris. On the Excel guides, I, I usually advise the best practice to avoid Excel. Second best practice is to store on SharePoint, then connect to data flow, and from there go into Power BI desktop. Should I, should I change my guidance from Chris? So I didn't catch all of that. Um, let me. Can you repeat the question? Sure. On the Excel guidance, are you the best is to avoid Excel? Second best is to store on SharePoint, then connect to data flow and for your desktop. Should I change my guidance? Um, so I would definitely avoid using Excel as a data source if you can, if performance is a problem. Now, um, sometimes you can't change that. I mean, sometimes you know, the data is in Excel and people want to edit it there. So there, there's, there may not be anything you can do. Um, SharePoint, like I said, can be slow as well, but there are other advantages to storing data in SharePoint. So I'm not saying don't use Excel or don't use SharePoint. What I am saying is that if you use Excel as a data source and you store Excel files in SharePoint, you may find that refresh is slow as a result. But if your Excel files are small, well, then um, you know that's not a real problem. Okay, thanks a lot, Chris. We don't have any more questions. Uh, there are questions from me. Uh, I'm wondering in terms of force between adding a calculated column on the Power Desktop side and adding the very exact same column column on the power query query side assuming that it's very simple uh, math column is okay the difference yes so for very simple calculations um, it can be more efficient to do it in power query um, simply because uh, the analysis services engine um, when it calculates calculated columns um, handles compression of calculated columns slightly differently and calculated columns are not compressed or not stored as efficiently as regular columns. So um, it might be slightly faster to do the calculation in DAX rather than in Power Query, but at the same time, it might make your queries slower. Um, so it's probably better to do it in Power Query if you're connecting to a relational database, it's probably better to do it in the relational database. Uh, Chris, I have also a quick question regarding this. Uh, mm -hmm. Regarding the union operation, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. customers are importing a large CSV and they want to add one more CSV on top of that. Mm -hmm. Instead of installing or loading all this file again, uh, it can be union in, of course, the power uh, pivot part, not mm -hmm. in the power query part. If this is the case, it is not loading the first part, first partition again, because it is already available. But if we union in power query part, it always refresh the previous parts as well. Uh, is there any way to uh, block this behavior and saying that just use the, this reference, not load again uh, this? old cache or old partition. Uh, I know it is not the uh, ideal case, of course, if it is possible, mm -hmm. it should be do on the reporting part, but this is the case sometimes. What is your yes, case? so I mean, even if you do the union in the in Power BI in DAX, then it will still, that doesn't change how the data gets loaded. Um, now, this is a, a very, <coughs> um, there are a couple of, blog posts uh, talking about how to do this. Um, and I've got a blog post on this as well that I wrote a, a couple of months ago. Um, there is no easy way just to keep the data in your data set and load new data in. Um, you can make incremental refresh do this. And um, I have a blog post. 
Okay, maybe uh, the next updates regarding external tools uh, mm -hmm. using Doc, uh, not Doc Studio, but uh, Tabular Editor. Mm -hmm. uh, we can manage partitions, right? Yes. So if we can manage partitions, we can load specific partition instead of loading all of them. Yes, but this would only be with premium. Uh, yes. And then you have to think about how you do the refresh of just individual partitions. And I think what you would have to do would be to do something like build an Azure function and know how to, you know, call the, um, you know, generate the uh, mm -hmm. Tom code to um, to just refresh individual yeah. partitions. So that because would be quite complicated. Uh, Power BI UI doesn't offer uh, individual refresh for partitions, right? Exactly. Just, yes. uh, incremental refresh or full refresh. Okay. Yes, exactly. Thank you. It is very clear. So uh, I just realized, but um, I'll put this in the meeting chat, but the this is the link to my blog post on um, that incremental refresh question. OK. OK, Dan, thank you very much I, again, Chris. Okay. All right. You. It was really great content. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I All right. Think... Sorry, Sorry do we have another comment? No, no, I was just saying thank you, that's all. <laughs> All right. OK, Th thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a good Goodbye. day. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.